Is it, uh, is it okay now? Oh, sorry. No, I mean, I've said it so that you will hear my natural voice, but they will get a recording. So, so uh, we won't hear me suddenly booming out, I hope. Are you guys okay? Can you hear it? Very good. Okay. All right. Okay. <coughs> yes. Yeah. <coughs> I'm particularly pleased to be speaking uh, at this geometry festival because the, uh, some of the work for which, uh, for which maybe I'm better known has to do with holonomy and is in many ways connected very closely with Jim Simon's thesis. And so I'd like to thank him for writing it if he's, uh, if he's here. Uh, and what I wanted to do today was talk some about the recent progress, and by recent I mean in the last 10 years or so, uh, although I'm going to try and concentrate a little more on, the, on something even more recent than that, uh, the recent progress in the holonomy classification problem. But before I start on the recent, let me uh, go back in time a little bit and talk about some of the history. Let's see if we're focused here. Uh, uh, the first slide is basically notation. The, uh, you start with a, a smooth, and I'm going to take one connected, that is simply connected and connected uh, in manifold. Uh, so for me, none of these questions about monodromy are going to show up in today's talk. The, uh, it's really going to be all about the curvature. The, uh, and a uh, NABLA connection on the tangent bundle uh, we look at the piecewise smooth paths uh, on the manifold, into the manifold, and we know that there's a well-defined notion of parallel transport, which was in fact the reason Carton wanted to define connections in this generality in the first place. Uh, and then uh, once one has a notion of parallel transport, there's a notion of the holonomy, which is the linear maps induced, these linear isometries, or isomorphisms induced by closed loops based at a point P gives a, uh, gives a subset of the linear transformations of, uh, of the invertible linear transformations of the tangent bundle. And in fact, it's easy to show by, uh, by composition of paths and inverse of paths that it's a group. Not only is it a group, it's, uh, it's determined up to conjugacy by uh, parallel transport. That is, if you if you know the, the holonomy set at, each, at any of two points, you join them by path, and then you just parallel translate the holonomy set over here. It's the, it's the holonomy set at this point. And the theorem that Carton implicitly assumed when he defined the thing in the first place, but, uh, but was, later only, was only later proved by Burrell and Lishnerovitz, is that the holonomy is in fact a Lie subgroup of the of GLTM. And in fact, it's not hard to show that any connected Lie subgroup of GLN is the holonomy of some linear connection on RN. Just, you know, if you choose your linear connection properly. Uh, I guess the only exception to that is n equal 1. I shouldn't, shouldn't have left that out, but I did. Uh, <coughs> shouldn't have let that hypothesis out, but I did. Now, because we're working in the tangent bundle and not just any old principal bundle, the, the notion of, uh, the no there is a, a further partial differential equation that you can impose on the holonomy, which, uh, uh, on the connection, which is that it's torsion be zero. That is, since, uh, since the sections of the bundle themselves are vector fields, you can differentiate, you can both differentiate them and use them to differentiate. And you write down this expression, it's easy to show that it's a tensor, and it's a first order partial differential equation on the, uh, on the, uh, well, actually, set up properly, it's first order algebraic equation, it's a zeroth order algebraic equation on the, uh, on the connection to ask that it be uh, torsion free. And these are the t connections that show up, for example, in Ramanian geometry most, most frequently, although when I come to the end of the talk, I'll point out that, that there's a good reason to study connections that are not torsion free. But I want to start out with this case because it's the, historically the most, uh, the most, uh, studied, and the relationship between the holonomy and the and the curvature 
is uh, set forth by the Ambrose Singer holonomy theorem, which says that uh, if you compute the curvature, that is, if you look at the endomorphism that you get by computing, commuting the uh, commuting covariant differentiation in two directions and subtracting off the uh, covariant differentiation with respect to the bracket. That's a, also a tensor field of, of endomorphisms. Uh, if you compute the, uh, the curvature, then the Lie algebra of the holonomy group is spanned by the endomorphisms, by these curvature endomorphisms, uh, where what you have to do, however, is you have to uh, parallel translate all the curvature endomorphisms from all the different points back to some fixed reference point and uh, take the span of those and that gives the, uh, that gives the holonomy, that gives the Lie algebra of the holonomy group. In particular, if the curvature is flat, I mean if the curvature is zero, that is the connection is flat, then of course the, that says the holonomy will be trivial because remember I'm assuming things are simply connected. Now. You can get some mileage out of this by observing the following few, the following elementary facts about the about the the curvature endomorphism, which is first of all, of course, it's skew-symmetric because of the very definition, and uh, the first Bianchi holds because the torsion is zero. That that is, it has this. Uh, that is, if you uh, take this expression and cycle sum on x, y, z, then you'll get zero. And what that says in, in sort of more, uh, in more invariant language, more tensorial language, is that this, the holonomy at this point, uh, the curvature endomorphism at this point actually lies in the kernel of this map, which is you just symmetrize on the last two indices, uh, the last three, skew symmetrize on the last three indices. That is, imagine, remember that Remember that the holonomy algebra sits inside here as a linear subspace. You just look at the kernel of that map. And uh, uh, I just said, the, whole, the Ambrose Singer theorem tells you that the, that, the, uh, that the curvature endomorphism lies in here. And it also has to lie in this kernel. So that motivates defining for any vector space uh, V and any Lie algebra H in the vector space, just define this set of possible curvature, so you know, sort of the proto curvature, if you want, the set of possible curvature tensors of that uh, of that sub -al sub algebra to be the kernel of this map. As you, uh, that's a that's a linear algebra, a representation theoretic sort of object, and a consequence, an immediate consequence of the Ambrose Singer holonomy theorem, is that uh, is uh, Marcel Berger's first condition for a uh, Lie algebra to be the algebra of a, of a torsion-free connection, uh, which is that if the see if the if this actually is the holonomy of a torsion-free connection, then the set of its possible the set of possible curvature tensors for this guy can't lie in any proper subspace of H tensor uh, wedge since the wedge to the star, because of course if it did, the, the Ambrose Singer holonomy theorem would force uh, would force the holonomy algebra to lie inside P, and it couldn't be all of H then. So that's the first condition. And since this can be computed uh, algebraically, you can check that out. Anything that doesn't satisfy this condition can be thrown out. It can't possibly be holonomy. Uh, that still leaves a fairly large group, fairly large set of of, uh, of Lie algebras. There's a second condition that uh, Berger derived, uh, which says look at the locally symmetric connections. They're the ones for which the curvature tensor is actually parallel. Now those are all constructed as, uh, those are all constructed in a very natural way using uh, Lie algebras. They're, homo they're connection, invariant connections on homogeneous spaces, it really comes down to an algebra problem, which is uh, significantly difficult. I mean, it's not, I, I don't want to dismiss it as, as trivial, because it's certainly not. But, uh, but that, that does sort of bring it down to, down to some finite calculation, rather than a, a problem in differential equations, which is, uh, which is what I want to concentrate on. Anyway, if you look at the, if you ask what space does the covariant derivative lie in, the second Bianchi, Bianchi identity tells you that it lies in the kernel of this skew symmetrizing map here, 
that just takes the uh, that just takes the k uh, khp, which remember has a lambda two b star sitting in it. Uh, skew symmetrize on that on the last three indices again, just like, just as before, and the covariant derivative has to lie in that. And so define k one k one of h to be the set of sort of the kernel of this skew symmetrizing map. It's the it's the proto covariant derivatives, and if if that's, uh, and just from the very definition and the Bianchi identity, it's true that uh, it's true that the uh, if you if a subgroup is the holonomy of some torsion-free connection that's not locally symmetric, then this space had had better be non-zero. So that that leads us. A strategy for determining what are the things that can be holonomy, which is first classify the groups that satisfy this first condition that the set of curvature tensors is not too small, and second, that the set of covariant derivatives of the curvature tensors, these proto spaces, are, are not zero. And that's an algebra problem, so, and, uh, uh, and it's been partly solved. It's not completely solved, as I'll, as I'll point out. Now, in the Ramanian case, there's a simplification. If the, if the group H is compact, then, uh, of course, that means it leaves parallel some positive definite quadratic form that you can just parallel translate uh, around and get an invariant metric. So H is actually the, the holonomy of a Ramanian metric. And the Durham splitting theorem tells you that, in fact, H has to split as a product if H preserves any splitting of, of the, this sort of every tangent space V, which is what my notation is supposed to represent here, uh, preserves some splitting of any one of these tangent spaces, then naturally, then necessarily, H is actually a direct product of groups, each of which acts in each one of the splitting fibers, uh, splitting some ends, and it acts, you can split far enough to make it act irreducibly. And in fact, you can show, although there's a little subtlety involved in this, as if you look in Bess's book on Einstein manifolds, they point out that that uh, that there's a slight gap in the literature to show that when you do that, that each of the HIs actually is holonomy of some Ramanian metric, so that you can then uh, apply Berger's criteria to each one of these. But uh, but it, that can be got around in, in a couple of different ways. I'll mention I'll mention uh, mention them in a minute. Well, so. Anyway, in the irreducible case, uh, in 1955, Marcel Berger, in his thesis, wrote, uh, did a classification of things satisfying, uh, a partial classification of the things satisfying his, uh, those two criteria. And uh, in particular, in the cases where, it's, uh, where the group acts irreducibly on V, and he didn't necessarily assume that it, preserved, that it was compact. Uh, and he, he pretty much came up with the complete classification with a few, uh, few exceptions I'll get to a little later. Uh, the compact groups on the list were, uh, were the following ones. And I remind you that, that it's the group sitting inside SON at, up to conjugacy, not the abstract group that you, uh, that you have to worry about. Because the same group, for example, if you look at SU2, SU2 sitting in, sitting, in, uh, sitting in SO4 in its usual, in its standard embedding can be holonomy. It's on this list. But if you look at the representation of SU2 sitting, the irreducible representation of SU2 sitting in, uh, sitting in SO6, that, that stand, you know, the, the, uh, the one that it actually sits in SU3, actually, that one cannot be holonomy. It's a, it's, it's a property of the, the way the algebra sits inside the vector space. Anyway, here's the list that was uh, of the compact things, the, the things that should be Ramanian, that, uh, that turned up on Berger's list. The, there's uh, the full orthogonal group, the unitary group in half the dimension, the special unitary group in half the dimension, uh, the quaternionic unitary group, if you will, SPN over 4 dot SP1, the uh, special quaternionic unitary group, SPN over 4, and then three exceptions, G2 in dimension 7, spin 7 in dimension 8, and spin 9 in dimension 16. And it was, 
I, I've heard this. I've heard this story uh, in in slightly different versions. I hope uh, now that now that we have the experts in the audience, and they can uh, they can tell us uh, the principles, so to speak, can tell us uh, uh, how this uh, how Jim Simons came to be uh, came to think about this problem. The the story as I as I remember it, I know I'm, it's a little dangerous right now. Uh, the story as I remember hearing it is that uh, is that Singer suggest noticed pointed out that these were the groups that act transitively on the unit sphere in dimension n and uh, in the various dimensions n and so uh, suggested that maybe there was a uniform way to prove this some way that didn't depend on going through the full classification theory uh, and that was that caught uh, Simon's attention and he uh, did it he actually produced a proof, uh, introduced some very clever ideas, by the way. It's, a, it's, a, uh, a, it's published in the Annals in 1962. And it actually, the proof actually uh, fills in this gap that I was mentioning about the, about the, uh, about the, uh, this, that the irreducible pieces would have to be holding on me as well when you, uh, when you read it carefully. Uh, although it, it is possible once you have a few, once you have some of the tools that we have available now, using exterior differential systems to fill it in another way, but uh, but that was the you know the the classification theorem still uh, even though there are, even though there are ways around it, uh, the published the part that's published and available is actually uh, still depends on this part of uh, this part of the thesis, and I bring this up because uh, there's a there's a similar question that I'd like to raise close to the end of the uh, end of the hour. Did I tell the story right? Is anyone here that... Yes? More or less. More or less. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I'll never get that epsilon down. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> right. <clears throat> uh, right. And, uh, of course, this is only the list of things that aren't ruled out by, uh, by Berger's list. I mean, and, and also, uh, Simon's proof was, uh, was a ruling everything else out kind of proof. Uh, ruled out everything except the things that act transitively in the spheres, and there was a question about whether or not those things actually did occur. Uh, the ones on the list that do occur, there's of course the generic metric has holonomy S O N. The uh, the generic Kähler metric has holonomy N over two. The uh, Ricci flat metric, Ricci flat Kähler metric has holonomy uh, S U N over two. Uh, there's a class of metrics called the hyperkähler metrics. They're the they're the Kähler metrics that have a parallel symplectic form. Uh, that and then these uh, quaternionic Kähler metrics, which are which you might think of as sort of the analog of uh, the analog of the Kähler is to Ricci flat as quaternionic Kähler is to hyperkähler. So you get to spin in the uh, in the scalars in the ortho in the uh, quaternionic group. Those things are all known to exist now. Uh, the uh, although they didn't all arrive at the same time, I believe, uh, if I remember correctly, Gene Kalabi was the first to write down in all dimensions the uh, an example, not compact, but an example of uh, of S U N over two, holonomy. No. no? No, no, no. I was, I was thinking about the non-compact case. Yeah. The non-compact case to write down an example, right? So that it's these things. By the way, I mean it's it's by no means trivial to write down an example of these things that uh, these things with these reduced holonomy groups. So you're solving a partial differential equation for the metric, and uh, and even writing down an example, a non-compact example, is is not trivial. And the compact examples are are, are highly non-trivial. Uh, anyway, uh, it turned out, by the way, that that uh, spin nine in uh, in 1968, Alexievsky announced that spin nine actually didn't occur as a non-symmetric metric. That the, that is the only way it occurs is actually as the holonomy of the uh, of the uh, octonionic projective plane and its dual, which uh, which turned out to be the, the case. And uh, it was an alternative, I, I think, almost simultaneous proof by uh, by Brown and Gray that it that it could not. 
And then in the uh, mid 80s, the, uh, I was able to show that the G2 and spin 7 cases do occur. And so that settled everything on the list, on the compact list. Uh, 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 the compact holonomy, it didn't show that there were compact examples. In fact, that's another story. It's quite long, and I don't, won't go into it because it's been reported on a lot. And in fact, I believe, uh, uh, I mean, one, of course, every geometer knows the story of, uh, of Yao's proof of the existence of compact examples with holonomy SUN. And Dominic, I think, in a, in a recent geometry festival, gave a, gave a talk on his proof, his construction of the metrics with holonomy G2 and spin 7 on compact 7 and 8 manifolds, which are, uh, uh, it's a very lovely construction, so, and, uh, and not at all, not at all obvious. I wanted to just, <clears throat> that, that's the compact case, I, I wanted to just put up a couple of tables, I know tables are the sort of the, the thing that makes one's heart sink in, the, uh, uh, in a talk like this. I'm not, I'm not going to expect you to remember the whole thing. Uh, I just want to point out uh, uh, that, you know, if you look in the, uh, I call this the Berger's metric list. When, when Berger did the classification, he actually, uh, he actually wrote down the examples that preserved a quadratic form and the examples that didn't preserve a quadratic form that act ir acted irreducibly. And, uh, and these, were, these were the ones on his list. And you'll notice that there's, uh, there's, in addition to the compact, each one of these, they're sort of broken up into the compact. There's one compact thing in each, uh, in each block, so to speak, and the other real forms that could, that could conceivably occur that preserve a quadratic form but aren't, uh, aren't definite. Uh, and uh, oh, this... Uh, SOPH, the quaternionic orthogonal group, so to speak, actually turns out not to occur either. That's both, both this one and this one don't occur. I just put, a, I put up this to point out the, uh, the uh, point out the names that, are, that have been attached to these, uh, to these geometries. So each one of these holonomies is now well, well studied as a geometry all its own. I'll have some more to say about those things. One thing I do want to put, the other thing I do want to put up, uh, and the main reason I put up the first table was to, so that I could put up this table, uh, is that if you ask not only do they exist, but how many are there? That's, that's a reasonable question in the sense that, uh, in the sense that up to locally how much information is necessary to, to describe an example like this, the uh, the, the notation I'm using here is modulo diffeomorphism. Uh, you know, D of L means D functions of L variables. So, for example, here's a, here's a familiar example that you might recognize from, uh, from the Kalabi Yau case, the SUPQ, or just think SUN if you want, uh, is, uh, is two functions of N minus 1 variables. The, what, and what I mean by that locally is if you write down the condition for the metric, if you write down the equation for the Kähler potential, there's, it's a second order elliptic equation for the Kähler potential. And those local solutions, modulo diffeomorphisms, are uh, two, functions, uh, two functions on a hypersurface. Now, in the real analytic category, it makes sense to talk about prescribing initial data along a hypersurface, even for elliptic equations. And these things are, these things are real analytic. They're, uh, in, uh, in, say, complex coordinates. And the same sort of thing is true for all of these. Uh, for example, the G2 manifolds, it turns out, that, turns out that to specify a G2 metric, it's enough to specify, uh, it's basically modulo diffeomorphism. You're on a seven manifold, it's enough to specify six arbitrary functions along a hypersurface. And that's, you know, modulo diffeomorphism. And the way you prove things like this is there's a, you set up a differential equation whose solutions are the metrics with that holonomy, and uh, it turns out that it's overdetermined, uh, it's highly nonlinear, but fortunately there's a machine that was developed precisely to solve things like, to, to handle things like this, developed by Carton, and you put it into Carton's machine, turn the handle, and that's the answer that comes out. That's how the, that's how the, the existence proof is done. The second block you, and 
Oh, yes, I'm sorry. That's a mistake. That should be, that, I mean, n should be 2n there. Right? What did I, oh, oh, I see. No, n is actually, yeah, n is actually 2p plus q. Right, yeah, sorry. Right. And these inequalities here are just meant to uh, avoid repetitions. Oh, one thing I should have said here is, uh, is there's a, uh, it turned out in doing the classification, and this is one of those, uh, one of those little, uh, the, the little missing examples that, that I was mentioning in Berger's classification. It turned out in going through the classification that there was another example that, uh, that should have made it on the list and didn't quite. Uh, those things are, in some sense, the, uh, the, uh, the analogs of, I mean, these, these guys, well, no, this guy is fine. That's where it belongs. But these are the real forms that should have made it on the list and didn't quite uh, in Berger's table. So. Now, well, that's my review of the, of the history up till about 10 years ago. I want to uh, I want to now come to what are some of the you know uh, some of the open problems and what some of the progress has been in the last ten years. But before I can get to that, I need to spend a few minutes talking about the uh, uh, talking about how some new examples were discovered. Oh wait, maybe I should say one more thing that I I mentioned. Whoops, sorry, where is it? Non-metric. Ah, yes. I mentioned that Berger's list had two parts. One that preserved, one that consisted of, of groups that preserved a quadratic form and one that didn't. Uh, I'm going to put this up because it'll show up again later. Uh, it plays a role in the story. The, this is the list of things that act irreducibly don't preserve a, uh, a quadratic form and and are uh, and were on Berger's list as possibly occurring as holonomy. Uh, there are things like uh, these are just the standard representations, just you know either SLNR or GLNR, SLNC or some subgroup of SLNC. I mean some subgroup of scalars times SLNC or SLNH. These things were all there, uh, and the various, again, they're broken up into blocks according to their, they're all, all the things in the blocks are real forms of the same, of, of some ideal complex guy. And, uh, and each of these actually does occur as holonomy, again, by the same sort of machinery that, that you apply to prove the existence of G2 and spin 7 holonomies. There's, uh, uh, and for example, you show that uh, you show that uh, holonomy in this dimension, holonomy with this subgroup of GL, this n, uh, that depends on that depends on one function of n variables. In the case that this scalar group is trivial, and it depends on n functions of n variables. In the case that the scalar group is non-trivial, there's a you know just a uh, you run through the all the possibilities, and and it's sort of a uh, it's not exciting. And so once you get the idea, you can you can uh, you can do the list. I, I I put it up because, like I said, this will this will uh, play a role. Although, don't worry, you don't have to memorize the list. And so, yeah. <clears throat> now, that was. Uh, let me change the scene a little bit. In the mid 1970s, Roger Penrose showed us how to solve the self-dual four-dimensional Einstein equations using Kadara's deformation theory uh, by applying it to rational curves in complex three manifolds. The idea was that you take, a, you take a, a rational curve in a complex three manifold with the property that its normal bundle, the normal bundle is isomorphic to two copies of O of two. O, o of two, is that right? O of one, I guess two copies of O of 1, and uh, it's not hard to show that the, I mean, the Kadara deformation theory then shows that the nearby P1s are, uh, uh, form a four-dimensional family, and you get this double vibration picture, uh, a three-dimensional complex manifold that contains a four-parameter family of real lines in it, 
uh, I mean, four parameter family, complex parameter family of lines, it gives you a complex four manifold, you get this double vibration picture. Uh, and lo and behold, it turns out that, that there's a natural, uh, there's a natural inner product, a complex inner product on the, on the tangent spaces to this uh, M4 that actually satisfies this nonlinear PDE, which is the, uh, which is the self-dual four-dimensional Einstein equations in, over the complexes. And in, by imposing appropriate reality conditions, you can actually get real four-dimensional, uh, uh, you can actually get real uh, self-dual four-dimensional Einstein manifolds. Uh, that was a that was a very exciting discovery that led to a lot of interesting work on solving, showing how to solve differential equations on four-dimensional di four self-dual Einstein equations by passing them over to this complex manifold and and uh, solving them in the holomorphic category. Was, uh, and Hitchin, in the early 80s, sometime in the early 80s, I haven't been able to track down the exact date of the paper. Uh, sometime in the early 80s, he showed that this, general, this uh, construction could be generalized and that you could get the hyperkähler and quaternion kähler cases by essentially the same sort, of, uh, same sort of analysis by looking at a rational curve in, uh, in a complex manifold dimension, uh, dimension 2n plus 1 and looking at its full modula and its normal bundle is, uh, is uh, I guess, 2n copies of O of 1 uh, then the deformation space turns out to uh, turns out to be a four four n dimensional manifold, uh, and you get a nice uh, you get a nice uh, geometric structure on it. You can uh, you can uh, show that all of the all of the hyperkähler and quaternion kähler spaces come this way by uh, by a construction of this kind. Now, he also studied a number of other spaces like this, that is, uh, moduli spaces, uh, you know, take a rational curve, say, in a surface, and take its normal bundle to be O of 1 or O of 2, and he showed that these gave rise to solving various different differential equations in, uh, in classical differential equation theory, that things that Carton had actually worked on in the early part of the century. Uh, in a completely different guise, uh, having to do with complete integrability of certain classes of differential equations. And in 1988, there was I was I was trying to understand some, uh, Hitchens' construction and some of the calculations he was doing, and I just took the next natural case, the uh, the case of a of a curve in uh, on a surface, a rational curve on a surface with normal bundle O of three, and uh, and started computing its uh, started computing what geometry lived on that moduli space, which is again a four-dimensional four-dimensional moduli space. The space of sections of O of three is a is a uh, has rank four, and that's the tangent space to the to the to the uh, uh, tangent space to the moduli. And lo and behold, it turned out that there was a natural connection. It induced a natural connection on this on this M four. And that connection had holonomy in this group, which was the standard degree three representation of SL2C, which is which sits in SL4. Oh, that should be a C there. C, not R. And together with scalars. And I, I was I was astonished by this because, although I hadn't memorized Berger's list, I knew it well enough that I thought I would have recognized that, and it should have been. Uh, should have been there, I thought, and so I went back and looked at Berger's list and, and found in the fine print, so to speak, this statement that, that the list that he gave was was all of them except with a finite number of exceptions, right? <coughs> and uh, and <laughs> kind of uh, all but a finite number of exceptions, right? So, well, no, finite meant finite, you know, not you know, not whole families. It's a, uh, and uh, and so it occurred to me that maybe there was something uh, something interesting going on. Anyway, I applied the uh, to make a long story short. I applied the uh, 
the methods that I was using had used in the other cases to try and understand the the holonomy of these two groups, that is, uh, the representation of SL2C in GL4C, in SL4C and C star times it, uh, and, the, and the real forms, and found out that yes, indeed, they did occur. There were examples of them. The, uh, the interesting case is that the representation, I mean, well, two interesting facts. One was that, the, was that this group, if you just left out the scalars, call that H3, sitting in SL4C, that group occurs as holonomy, but, it's, but the connections that, uh, that occur, modular diffeomorphism, depend only on constants. It's not like all the other cases where, where either there was a symmetric example and it was essentially unique, or else there was, uh, or else the, the solutions depend on arbitrary functions. This was something that was actually rigid uh, with, once, you put in a, once you put in a single parameter. And that was kind of astonishing. I'd never seen anything like that before and, and uh, uh, went around giving talks about that. And, uh, and it caught the attention of a few people that, uh, that looked into the problem far more, uh, far more deeply than I did. And I want to tell you a little bit about what they found. In the 1990s, uh, uh, several people, pr principally uh, Schwachhofer, uh, Chi, and Merkulov, looked at this, looked at the holonomy problem, and went back to it and decided to try and uh, try and see if they couldn't actually uh, actually solve the problem uh, and find these missing things on the list. There was uh, they uh, they uh, they got. Fairly far, they, they started finding more examples. I'll say, say something about those in a few minutes. Uh, and Merkulov proved a very interesting theorem that uh, its significance wasn't, wasn't realized until, uh, until uh, somewhat later, though. Proved that this picture that had turned up, that had turned up this exceptional guy, this, uh, this picture of, of a deformation state of, of the the connections that arise arising as the connections on some moduli space of deformations of some compact complex manifold, that picture actually is very general. That Merkulov proved that any torsion free connection with holonomy and irreducible group uh, in GLNC can be obtained as, as a canonical connection on the moduli space of Legendrian submanifolds of some contact manifold, X, with the appropriate normal bundle. Uh, I don't want to go into the whole list. I don't don't really won't really quite have time to do that. But uh, but armed with this information, he and Schwachhofer actually were able to compile a list of what the possible uh, what the possible uh, candidates were for uh, Legendre submanifolds and contact manifolds that could generate a moduli space that would have that would have these kind of holonomy. I, I highly recommend. The, uh, partic in particular, uh, Schwachhofer's uh, uh, Habilitation, Habilitation Schrift that just came out last year on the, on the subject. It's a, and, uh, and then Schwachhofer sort of went back to Berger's, uh, Berger's original approach and uh, completed the classification purely algebraically. He, uh, uh, he, that is, he went back to uh, the the original approach of looking at the irreducible representations and and uh, finding out which ones of them satisfied Berger's criteria one and two and proved that surprisingly I mean it, this was a surprise to all of us that uh, that those necessary conditions which are sort of the first obvious necessary conditions you can imagine are actually sufficient is everything that satisfies those conditions uh, actually does occur as holonomy. And so it gives a nice, simple description of the things that are, although if you actually want the list, you have to work. Uh, and before I go on to my, the next talk, let me just say what, I mean, I'll, I'll put this up because this, this comes back to this, uh, uh, this remark that I wanted to make. This is kind of a long list. Uh, so. Here's the, here's the heading, exotic holonomy. Exotic is just the word we've been using for things that didn't turn up on Berger's list. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, and uh, <clears throat> what does the double bar mean? The, uh, the, the first ones in this family are all things that, uh, that I had found sort of by, by uh, sort of futzing around with what I knew about the classifications and representation theory and when I was writing survey papers and stuff like that. So I found these, uh, these examples of groups that actually do occur as holonomy, although it's only very recently that I've been able to show that, this, that these two guys actually do occur as holonomy. They do. Uh, the, uh, uh, and they, uh, uh, and the, these all occur, and they occur, these were kind of surprising, sort of exceptional ones that showed up on the list. These are the ones that, that had shown up in the twister theory that I had mentioned earlier. These two that show up in dimension 16 and dimension, uh, in dimension 27 were, uh, I'll, I'll mention in a few minutes why those had to turn up. Uh, but they turn up and they depend on arbitrary functions. That is, uh, you know, the, the, the holonomies that can occur with the, uh, the, the connections, the torsion-free connections that can occur with those holonomies are, uh, are uh, uh, they depend on arbitrary functions in there. And these were the ones that if you, if you, if you take the exhaustive approach that Schwachhofer did, and, and grind through everything, it turns up these additional examples. Uh, these, uh, and these were something of a surprise because they actually, uh, they actually are an infinite family that was missed. It's a, it's a, a one parameter family of them. The others, uh, you know, there's a finite number of them, but you'll notice that, that there's a set of Complex exam there's a complex example in each one. Well, ignore that one. This one, 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 and this one. And if you look at that list for a few minutes, uh, well, it didn't su suggest anything to me, and it didn't suggest anything to, Lor to uh, Lawrence, I don't think, but it certainly did to uh, Wolfgang Ziller, who looked at it and said, hmm, those are the isotropies of the, uh, of the quaternionic symmetric spaces. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and sure enough, they are. And, uh, uh, and you'll notice that, that essentially, except for these sort of uh, you know, they, these sort of elementary examples in dimension four that aren't, actually aren't very interesting, uh, that's all the exceptional list. And the only way we know that this is the list is that, is that we have gone through the representation theory and ground it all out. But the fact that the answer came out so nicely as they're the, they're the isotropies of the, of the, uh, the, they're the complexifications of the isotropies of the, of the quaternionic symmetric spaces, the fact that the answer came out so nicely suggests that maybe there's a uniform way to prove this. That there's some higher explanation for this than just accident. But whatever that explanation is, we don't know it. It's sort of like the, the higher explanation that, uh, that Jim Simon sought when he wrote his thesis for, for why the compact groups, uh, the, the compact groups that showed up did show up. And uh, uh, it's a mystery. What can I say? Anyway, I wanted to point that out. It's a sort of interesting problem. So. Now, that would, that would appear to cover, you know, that covers the irreducible case, and you might think, well, that ends the story. But in fact, it doesn't. There's a, the reducible cases aren't reducible to the irreducible cases. That is, just, just knowing the answer in the irreducible case doesn't, uh, doesn't by any means solve the problem. And, uh, the, the case where the, where the group acts reducibly is still very much open. There's not a splitting theorem. You know, in the Ramanian case, the Durham splitting theorem tells you that, tells you that if it preserves, a, if it preserves a subspace, of course it preserves a splitting, and so, uh, so you can, and then the Durham splitting theorem tells you that it just splits as a product. But uh, in 1967, Wu gave an example where the, where you have a subgroup preserves an indefinite metric, and yet the connection is not e is uh, is indecomposable. You can't write it as a product, 
and uh, and a few years later, Kay and Wallach showed that 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 can happen even for symmetric connections. That that you can't reduce even the symmetric case. That by symmetric I mean a symmetric space in the in the classic sense of the word. You can't even reduce that to the irreducible case. And for the last few years, oh sorry, I misspelled the. Ah, hmm. Yeah, you know what? I, I uh, instead of instead of backslash accent e, I've typed in an accent. That's the trouble with working with a Macintosh. Yeah. So, <clears throat> right. Yeah. Uh, a Macintosh allows you to type that, and you can't tell. Anyhow, right. Barad Bergerie, uh, Lionel Barad Bergerie, and uh, and your student Ikamakan. Ikamakan. Do. Do you know how it's pronounced? Ekamakin, right? Uh, have been studying the cases where the holonomy preserves a quadratic form and and an isotropic plane in that uh, with respect to that quadratic form. And uh, horror of horrors, I even have examples where, for example, you know, in signature five one, where the where uh, of course it's a Lie group. The holonomy is a Lie group, but it, but nothing said it had to be a closed Lie subgroup. And uh, here they have an example where the where the holonomy is not even closed. Uh, so, so, uh, the most recent thing I have to say about this is uh, uh, is something that has to do with uh, has to do with the case, sort of the exact op, the exact the the most split case you can imagine. That is, uh, uh, but before I can state state the theorem, let me. Uh, I want to. Uh, I want to uh, make a little definition. Go back to this sort of every vector space here, and take a Lie subalgebra, and define the first prolongation, this space here, to be the kernel of this map. That is, it's the. You know, if you remember that this thing is sitting inside v tensor v star. And uh, and uh, just skew symmetrize. Look at the subset of this that 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 goes to zero when you skew symmetrize subspace that goes to zero when you skew symmetrize on the last two indices. In other words, it's this guy. The first prolongation, which was originally defined by Carton in his study of the uh, in his study of the pseudo groups, uh, the continuous infinite pseudo groups. He, uh, if you look at the and I want to also consider the following representation that works. You know, anytime you have a subgroup of GLV, you can take the so-called anti-diagonal representation. That is, uh, that is, uh, just embed it here naturally and here as the contragradient representation, and that sits inside this space, preserving, of course, an inner product. I mean, preserving, preserving a splitting, and this space V plus V star has both a natural metric and a natural symplectic form, right? Where the where the where these two spaces are just dual subspaces are just dual to each other, and so this delta H sits inside it sits inside a uh, both a O N N and it sits inside S P N, so the it preserves you know metric and and symplectic form. If you uh, there's a, a little theorem. So that simplifies the uh, simplifies the search for the things that might satisfy Berger's conditions, which is that if this thing can be the holonomy of a torsion-free connection, then the first prolongation has to be has to be non-zero. In other words, if you have a subgroup of O N N that preserves a isotropic splitting, and it can be holonomy and and acts irreducibly. Oh, sorry. Whoops. If this is the oh no no, no that's that's true. That's correct. All right. If if this is true, then uh, you know, if this is going to be holding on me of a torsion-free connection, then this has to be non-zero. Now, yeah, coming close to the end here. Now that raises the question: How many such things are there? Uh, and here's the irreducible list. It was uh, essentially compiled by Carton, although he only did the complex case and. Uh, he only did the complex case, and he only uh, and he missed a few. Uh, he missed these two down here, uh, but he had the others. Now, uh, 
these are the irreducible groups over the reals with their first prolongation non-zero. So these are these are candidates for holonomy the, of a uh, of a connection that preserves uh, a metric of split signature and the Lorentzian splitting. And the theorem is the theorem is they all occur, every single one of them. They're all holonomy of such a such a uh, such a metric, but everything below the double bar occurs only as a symmetric example. Whereas the things above the double bar occur as a symmetric, oh, I should say one case, you have to leave out, you have to leave out that, let's say, equals the identity here. That's the only one that occurs, I mean, you can't get that scalar. Uh, but everything else occurs as a, uh, as holonomy of such a thing and preserves the splitting. Uh, preserves the splitting so that these are all symmetric. And, and these examples are well known. Uh, they're not symmetric spaces, but no, 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 they're, they're symmetric spaces. What did I say? Uh, uh, just, just to tie to yesterday's talk, if you look at this example right here, the, the structure that I defined on the, uh, on, you'll remember the, the, uh, uh, Fensler manifolds of constant flag curvature, the, say constant curvature minus one, you'll remember in those examples, in particular, let's say, look at the Hilbert example that I wrote down with constant negative curvature, you'll remember that those things had a, you know, so here's the Hilbert example, the, remember it was the, the, you know, you had, here's an N manifold, uh, let's say N plus one manifold, and sigma, whoops, around the other way, sigma, and the space of geodesics, lambda 2n. And you'll remember, well you may not remember, but yesterday I mentioned that, uh, that it had a symplectic form and a metric of signature nn. And that this was parallel with respect to this. So this is an example of, uh, of these guys. This is a, an example of this, of this kind here. And in fact, they all, they all come this way. There's a uh, uh, so, in particular, this shows you, just looking at Hilbert's example, taking, taking a strictly convex domain in, uh, in uh, R n plus 1, then any strictly convex domain gives an example of such a thing. So these things depend at least on one arbitrary function of, of n variables. And in fact, that's their local generality. That's what they depend on. Finally, in my la the last few minutes, I want to talk, mention briefly uh, another problem that has, uh, that has surfaced in the last few years that's tr actually turned out to be quite interesting is, uh, is in connection with physics. The, in recent years, uh, the physicists have, some of the, phys some of the physicists, it's a large tribe as you know, uh, some of the physicists have proposed a, a, a theory called H-theory in which they augment the usual sigma model with uh, supersymmetric sigma model with a, uh, they augment the Lagrangian by a three form, the, uh, uh, the, which they call the H field. Uh, the, the essential features of this H theory, I'm going to leave out the, the, the phi field and things like that, but this is, this is the thing that they're, uh, one, one thing they're largely interested in is, is a metric and a three form. And what they want to use the three form for to do is to modify the levi trivita connection by an expression of this kind. That is, you just take the, you know, I'm writing the structure equations here. So this would be the, these would be the structure equations for the levi trivita connection. Uh, uh, if, if omega 1 to omega n or just a normal co-framing. And you just add, just add the connection to the, uh, you just add the coefficients of the, of the three form to the, uh, to the uh, connection matrix. And of course that makes sense, it's skew-symmetric because it's skew-symmetric in those indices. So. And what the physicists are particularly interested in is they want this, the resulting connection to have a reduced holonomy. The thing they really want to look for are parallel spinners. So and if they're going to have parallel spinners, they, I mean delta tilde parallel spinners, then uh, uh, those are the things that generate their, uh, their, essentially generate their supersymmetry transformations. And they want to also impose the condition that, that the three form be closed. 
Now, right. Now, the condition that the whole binomial be reduced and that the three form be closed is is now a set of PDE for both a metric and a three form. Uh, it's overdetermined. There's uh, yeah. uh, one thing that comes out immediately when you start looking at it is you realize that that you cannot uh, you cannot reduce it. The Durham splitting theorem doesn't hold in general. There, that is, the whole number can be reduced. In fact, the whole number can be trivial without it being a product. And, uh, uh, it, actually, the, the first result on these, on these things is actually kind of nice. The, it was proved by Cart, Carton and, and Scouten back in 1926, which is that if the holonomy of this modified connection is trivial, that is, if it's actually parallel, you might think, oh, well, that must mean it's flat. But of course, it doesn't because of, because of the eta. But what you can say is that it forces it to be locally a product. That is, g is a product metric and eta is a product, is a sum of, of three forms where each of the sum ends is either, there's two kinds of solutions. One is there's a, the bi-invariant metric on a Lie group and A to I is its Carton three form. And then the connection, the, the modified connection is just the, the left invariant parallelism. In fact, that's what this, that's what adding this, adding this uh, H field to the connection does. Or, it, there's one exception to that, and that is the GI is the standard metric on S7, and A to I is the invariant spin 7 three form. Remember, spin 7 is defined in R8, in S08, as the stabilizer of a four form. You can left hook that four form with a radial vector field and get a three form on the sphere that's invariant under spin 7. It turns out that that, that, that pair, G eta, satisfies these conditions, except that it doesn't satisfy D eta equals zero. It, satisfies, it makes the whole nomi trivial, and, but it doesn't satisfy d8 equals zero. If you impose the d8 equals zero condition, then those guys can't happen. Now, with a little work, I've, I've gone, through some, gone through some preliminary investigations on this, and this is definitely work in progress. Uh, with a little work, you can show that every subgroup of SO3, SO4, and SO5 occur as holonomy with the appropriate with an appropriate three form in this uh, in this you know this this H field theory as metrics with prescribed holonomy the first counterexample the first thing that can't be holonomy uh, turns out in uh, turns out in dimension six if you look at the irreducible representation of SU two then you can't choose a three form and a metric so that the perturbation gives you uh, gives you that as holonomy but that's the first thing that doesn't show up so. The classification problem promises to be more interesting in dimension 7. The physicists are particularly interested in dimensions 6, 7, and 8, I'm told. And they're particularly interested in the cases where the holonomy reduces to give you things with lots of parallel spinners. And those cases, there are lots of them, in fact, it turns out. So uh, you can write down the generality, the degree of generality much in the way as you can for the G2 case with no three form. Uh, but I think in the interest of time, I won't uh, describe those, those constructions now. So thank you for your attention. Yes. Oh.
a one parameter subgroup. Yes, 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 that occurs. Right. Uh, let's see if I can. Unfortunately, I didn't. Oh, yeah, for example, in one dimension, you can certainly get, I mean, look at the one dimensional subgroups of C star. You know, they're, they're circles or spirals or, or a line, right? And all of those occur as holonomy. Oh, yes, right. Sorry, I, yeah, I, yeah, my notation, whoops, I mean, my notation here, here, you know, G sub F notes any connected subgroup of F star, any connected subgroup, yeah, that's right, sorry, so it's all in the fine print. <laughs> Just the last question concerning the last uh, thing you mentioned. Uh, in the case of the uh, seven-dimensional squash sphere, so you have one of these situations where you have a three-form. Uh, you, you mean like this this guy? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, but you seem to have said that a lot of uh, spinners are parallel. That is not really a parallel. No, no, no. That I mean, the only the one that exists here for the parallel for 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 the holonomy to reduce, that's the standard metric on the seven so sphere. It's not the squashed. If you take the squash metric on the seven sphere, that can't have no three form can you add that will reduce the holonomy to trivial for that. So okay, right. so you, you get the non trivial holonomy then. Yes, yes, always a non trivial holonomy in that case. Yeah. Although I don't know how low it can go. That's an interesting question. Yeah. Are there further questions? Yeah. Okay, so we thank you.